the, uh, the story of Nicodemus and uh, John chapter three, we'll, uh, we'll touch base with the, uh, probably the most favors, famous verse in all of scripture, John 3.16. Uh, it seems to be uh, uh, the one that gets plastered all over sporting events and things of that sort. So uh, most people um, probably have heard it a, a few times in their life. But uh, this is the story of Nicodemus. And the scriptures tell us that he was a leader in Jerusalem, a Pharisee. He came to Jesus one night and said, teacher, we, and I don't know whether he was alone when he came or not, but he was identifying that uh, not only he, but others, we cannot deny that uh, you have been sent by the hand of God to teach. The things you do prove that God is with you. I, Jesus said, well, I tell you the truth. The kingdom of God cannot be seen by a person unless they have been born a second time or born again. That's where that phrase originally comes from. How does an old man become born a second time? Nicodemus asked. I don't know how one could enter into his mother's womb again. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. A person must be born both by water and by spirit in order to enter the kingdom of God. There are two births, one of the flesh, another of the spirit. Do not be shocked that I tell you that you need to be born a second time. You know the wind goes wherever it pleases. You hear it, but you cannot tell where it came from or where it will end up. People born of the spirit are the same. Nicodemus, still not understanding, asked, how does one become born of the Spirit? Jesus replied, I thought you were a teacher of the writings of God, and this does not make sense to you. I tell you the truth. I know what I'm saying and have seen the Spirit's coming. Listen and accept what I am telling you. If I tell you about things you can see on earth and you do not believe, how will you understand if I tell you of the things of heaven? There is no one to tell you of heavenly things except the one who has come from heaven, the son of man, for heaven is his home. You remember how Moses lifted up the servant, serpent before the people in the desert. In the same way, the son of man will be lifted up. Anyone who turns to him and believes will enjoy eternal life. So Nicodemus arrives under the uh, cover of darkness and, and he's come to the conclusion that Jesus could not do what he's doing without God's help. And he's impressed by the things that Jesus is doing. But thinking somebody is from God and being impressed is not enough to get him into heaven. Plenty of people believe in Jesus. The Bible even says that the demons believe and tremble. He lived and taught good things. Lots of people believe that. But that's not enough to enter into heaven. Jesus said you need to be born a second time. Now, this is standard beginning theology of, of Christianity and sort of a foundation from which we uh, uh, move ahead. Uh, I remember back in the college days when the pastor arrived at, uh, well, the associate pastor, youth pastor arrived at First Pres Santa Barbara, and he was talking about coming to know Jesus in a personal way. And I would venture to say that the seven or eight hundred people who were members of that church, very few of them knew what he was talking about uh, because they were people like Nicodemus who were academically involved in their faith in, in Jesus, but they really were not uh, emotionally and spiritually involved in that. Uh, so Jesus is saying we've got to be first born by human because that's how we get here. That's born of water. But then we also need to be spiritual in nature, born of the spirit. And uh, so we raise the question, what is born again? If, 
if just believing in Jesus and just being impressed by what he did is not enough from Jesus's perspective to enter into heaven, but we must do this thing called born again. Uh, what, what is it? What is it? I guess is the question. I mean, the results of it, we know we get to enter heaven. We get our sins forgiven and we get to know Jesus forever. So how do we become born again? Nicodemus was rational. And like him, our human rational thinking gets in the way. We raise the question, well, we can't go back into the womb. So what does it mean to be born of the spirit? And that was his question. We would prefer, I think, to be able to say, I went to a class and I learned about Christianity. There are plenty of pastors I know, not trying to judge at all, but plenty of pastors that I know who have gone to an academic school, received a spiritual degree, actually are able to call themselves a master of divinity. That's the, that's the degree that you get from seminary and really don't quite know Jesus. Matter of fact, I've met a few of them in the Presbyterian church who say they're not even sure they believe Jesus was human. Uh, you know, so it's a very interesting world in, in which we live. That academic degree seems to be the key to some. And I think it was for uh, Nicodemus as well. In that, in that day, they had the right learning to be experts of the divine and still they missed what God was doing. Remember Jesus said one time, uh, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you'll find eternal life, but it's they that bear witness to me. That's what Jesus said. If, if you are reading the scriptures and studying the scriptures and you can't see me, you've missed the whole point of the scriptures. I got all excited back in uh, college in UC Santa Barbara. There was a class on the Bible as literature. And I decided I was going to go take that class. And I went into the classroom and it was standing room only. I mean, there were so many people. This was um, what in the late 60s. So the Jesus movement was going on at the time and people were all excited. And I was standing uh, actually sitting because I got there early, uh, was in the class. And the first thing the professor said is if you came here to learn about religion or know something about Jesus, then I would suggest you leave right now because all we're going to do is talk about the Bible as literature. And, uh, you know, the next day, half as many kids were in class because they had all come for what he said he was not going to, to offer. Uh, I stayed, I thought it was a, a helpful class in my understanding of, of Christianity, but uh, it, you can be well-versed in the scriptures and miss Jesus in the midst of it. Uh, and Jesus was a little surprised that the Pharisees could do that. God asks us, like Jesus asked Nicodemus, is to take a step of humility. And humility is a hard one, uh, especially when, when our mind gets in the way, because we somehow think that, that we're smarter than, um, than, than anybody else, okay? And we think that we've, we've figured it out and when we start to think that way, then our pride gets in the way of our, our seeing or following Jesus. I think the best story of that, there are probably plenty of them in scripture, but I think the best story of that is the story of Naaman back in uh, the book of Kings. <clears throat> if you remember, he was uh, a warrior, not from Israel, uh, from Syria, I believe, but uh, someplace else. And uh, he, he was uh, a man of prestige. He uh, uh, was, had all kinds of things going for him. 
except he was a leper and he had leprosy. And his wife had a young servant. And I, I love this story because it's got all these servants in it. Pay attention to the servants. Had this young servant from Israel who had been captured in a previous war, brought to this other country, uh, and now she was serving Naaman's wife. And she said, oh, well, you know, if my master would just go down to the prophet down in Samaria, down in Israel, he would be healed. Wife goes and says to Naaman, you need to go see the prophet. And of course, Naaman, I don't know whether he was believing what the girl said or uh, just dutifully doing what his wife told him to do, but he went down to Israel. Matter of fact, he went into the king and he says, I've got, I've got to go do this. The king says, here, let me give you a letter to the king of Israel. He takes the letter down to the king of Israel and the king of Israel uh, doesn't believe that a prophet has any value and poo-poo's the thing and sends Naaman on a wild goose chase for a while. But he finally shows up at Elijah's tent. Just a lonely tent. And Elijah the prophet doesn't even come out to see Naaman. He sends his servant out. Another servant, okay? And the servant says, Elijah tells you, go wash seven times in the Jordan River. Naaman, scripture says, I thought he would surely come out to me, after all, I'm a dignitary, right? Come out to me and stand and call upon the name of Yahweh, his God, wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. And then he got mad. He said, aren't the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. And see this, this warrior wanting the best treatment. And God had another thing in mind. So now his servants, third set of servants in this process, come to convince him and they said my father if the prophet had told you to do some great thing would you not have done it how much more then when he says to you wash and be clean wouldn't you just go wash and so he humbled himself he did away with some of his pride. He walked down to the river and he dipped himself seven times in the water and came up the seventh time completely clean. The difference between pride and humble. Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, you are proud. You are convinced that you know better than God because you are an academic student of the word. You come in darkness, you're hiding, you say you believe, but you really don't want the world to know that you believe. You don't want your fellow Pharisees to know you believe. Do you really believe? I wonder what Nicodemus actually began to feel like when his faith took that turn and he started proclaiming to some that he really did believe that Jesus was the Son of God. And then all of a sudden, his humility sets in rather than his pride and his life begins to change. Jesus said this in uh, going back to John 3, 16 and following. God's love for this world is so great that he sent his only child, a son, and everyone who believes in him will not see destruction, but will have life eternal. God is not interested in having the son judge the things people do, but desires all to find life and wholeness 
through the Son. A person who chooses to believe in the Son will not be judged. Anyone choosing not to believe judges themselves as guilty by their unbelief. The only freedom from judgment comes in believing and trusting in the name of God's Son. This is judgment, the scripture says. Light has come into the dark world through the sun. Those who love darkness more than light, what they do is evil. People who do evil hate the light. They avoid being in the light because they do not wish to have their deeds exposed, known, judged. Because they believe that God will judge them. Those who walk in truth and in the light do not mind having their deeds exposed because their deeds are done with God's help because he is there to work through us. Jesus and the disciples left Nicodemus and went out away from town to where they were staying, where they were baptizing people who came to them. So being born a second time, born again, that's, that's what we call salvation in, uh, uh, in Christian terms and that jargon that, uh, that we use too often, I suppose. Uh, it comes from believing in Jesus, but believing that he is our Messiah, that he is our Savior, that he is the one who uh, is Lord of our lives. And it, it comes from that humble step of belief that we take where we say, uh, I no longer want to trust my own ability to get me through this life, but I want to believe that God has provided salvation for me in Jesus Christ. Um, it's not in God's nature to be uh, punitive towards people. He does everything he does out of love. If God loves us, why wouldn't we want to come to him and have our sins exposed? But people often think that God is um, doing bad things to them because of their sin. They think if they confess, he'll punish them. They live in fear of being wrong, which is the work of the devil, putting that fear in them. They seek rational reasons to say that they're okay the way they are. Um, there, there's no God. That's the, the biggest rational reason to avoid having to feel guilty is that there's no God, so I can do what I want to do. Um, they say, well, God is there, but he's so far away. He's not intimately involved in what's going on, so I can still do what I want to do. I mean, if you understand what's really going on in life, everybody who's turned away from God, everybody who doesn't want to know Jesus, for the most part has said, I'm better without him. And that's a pretty proudful statement uh, as opposed to humbly coming to God. There are people who say, well, as long as I'm good, I'm okay. And they define good, interestingly enough, as being able to keep the commandments, except they don't ever look at the first four commandments. They just look at the next six. You know, the first, first four, if you remember, there's no other gods besides me. Okay, nobody, nobody says I'm good because I uh, believe in all kinds of gods. That, that doesn't work. Okay, uh, there's no idols. There's uh, a need to respect God's name, and there's a need to honor his uh, day of rest. Uh, those are the four that nobody ever says, I keep the commandments, okay? Um, because they're looking for justification of their life, and they don't want a God that is up there, that is leading them, that is guiding them, and is asking them to honor him, okay? So they just want uh, to say, I'll honor my parents, I won't commit murder, I won't commit adultery, I won't steal, I won't lie, I won't covet. Uh, they say, I've, I've done all of those things pretty well, just like the 
rich young ruler that came to Jesus and said, I've kept the commandments my whole life. And Jesus says, well, then sell everything. You know, let's see how, how devoted you really are at that particular point. God's not interested in condemning us. He says the judgment comes our way when we choose not to believe in Jesus. We are the ones who would make our own judgment. We are the ones that, that choose to no longer uh, be a follower, to not be a follower of Jesus Christ. Those of us who have chosen to follow him, we have walked past judgment in some ways. Uh, we put our trust in him. Uh, we put uh, our belief that when we get to heaven and there, the judgment is there that we will be called to uh, uh, follow him into heaven because we have done good things uh, for other people in his name. Um, people who are afraid to come into the light of God's presence, as the scripture said, um, don't really want the uh, forgiveness. Well, they want the forgiveness, but they don't want to become humble enough and admit that their their sins are there. Jesus come or Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night. He doesn't want to be exposed. He would be outcast from his friends if he did say something. Some of us feel that way sometimes and just decide religions off the table. We're not going to talk about religion around certain friends or, or family members even. Um, but in reality. Uh, Jesus has asked us to be honest about our faith with everybody. Nicodemus is on the edge of faith, almost born again, but his pride is in the way. <clears throat> Jesus is asking us to humbly open the doors to the things of the Spirit. Born again is that step of humility. Humility where I know I'm not right with God, with God, I'm really not right in the way I ought to be living and I need to change my ways. Once I've made that step, I keep coming back to that step over and over and over again because I sin. I, I know I do, I see it from time to time. Um, I feel it more than I see it in my life and I'm just aware of the fact that I I step away from God's path. <clears throat> what is the statement? I uh, wander uh, uh, and rather than following the narrow path, I get off the path once in a while. We, uh, but every time we realize that we come back into the light of the exposure where we say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I appreciate the love you've shown to me. <clears throat> then I expect you uh, will show it again because you are a forgiving God. When Jesus had laid that truth on Nicodemus, he walked away. He said, that's it. Nicodemus is either going to believe it and change his ways or he's not. Uh, I remember um, some other study I was doing this week. Uh, Jesus had sent out the uh, disciples by twos and said, uh, you know, heal the sick and proclaim the kingdom of God. And if somebody doesn't want to believe it, they said, shake off the dust of your feet and move on. Uh, and I, I wouldn't say we move on and quit praying for those people, but we, we move on to somebody who will uh, want to hear the message. Um, the, the ball was in Nicodemus's court. He needed to do something with it. And Jesus didn't need to be around for that to happen. Uh, I remember Chip Ingram years ago from Santa Cruz Bible Church uh, uh, said there are thousands of people in this county who are waiting for someone to come to them 
with the message of Jesus Christ. Rather than harping over the same people, hoping that one of these days they'll get it. Jesus is basically saying to us, go out into the world, find people who want to know this message and bring them to me and pray for the rest of them. And maybe the door will open for them as well. But uh, we need to learn from the story of Nicodemus, the humility of doing what Jesus asks us to do and not saying, I've got this figured out. I don't have it figured out yet. I've been doing this for almost 50 years and I'm still not sure I've got it figured out. But I do know that one of the things he calls us to do is to humbly go into the world and share the love of Jesus Christ with others. And I, I just encourage you to not hide in the darkness, but step into the light, both in confessing your sins, but in your acknowledging to the world that you are a believer in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's turn to uh, our final hymn.